Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Avisa, for hosting. Uh, let me just acknowledge uh, some of our guests here this evening. His Royal Highness Prince Turkil Faisal of Saudi Arabia, U.S. Special Envoy Tim Lenderking, for Special Envoy for Yemen, Ambassador Hanan Tashiri of Basari. Am I pronouncing Basasi? Yeah, my apologies, but welcome. It's great to have you here. And Minister and Ambassador Yusuf El Ataiba of the United Arab Emirates. Wonderful to have you here and wonderful to have everyone here. Such a great crowd, wonderful people to talk with Hadley Gamble. And in introducing Hadley, Greg was kind enough to give us her background and affiliation. I'm going to put a personal note on it. Uh, I met Hadley about 11 years ago. I was executive director at the International Institute for Strategic Studies U.S. and corresponding director of the IISS Middle East office. And one day I got a call from Joe Robert, who many of you know is a wonderful guy and he was a good friend of the IISS and many here, and I know a happily close friend of, of yours and mentor. And Joe said, uh, Andrew, I want you to meet this really impressive young woman reporter uh, she's already making a name for herself. So you were at Fox at the time. You had been at ABC, and he said, she's amazing, and she's going places. Would you include her in some of your IISS activities? And I said, sure. And ever since that time, we've become friends and colleagues, and my admiration for Hadley has grown immensely. Uh, her commitment to the news, her integrity as a reporter. She packed up and moved to the Gulf because she was seized with the idea of the importance of that region for global energy security, international security, and international economy more broadly. And through her reporting, her interviews, her access, and, and there I said, her analysis, which is about the sharpest I come across in the business. So. It's with thanks and appreciation for your friendship, for your doing this event tonight with El Monitor and having you here. So, welcome. Um, and let's get right into it. <laughs> He's made me cry. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you were at the OPEC Plus meeting in Vienna. Uh, there was a decision for uh, by the cartel to cut two million barrels per day of production. This has introduced further friction into the U.S.-Saudi relationship. It seemed the relationship was getting back on a better track after President Biden's visit to the region. Tell us about that meeting, how you see U.S.-Saudi relations now, and going forward, how do you get the relationship back on track where it has been before, if it can be? That was an amazing introduction. He's box office. Thank you, Andrew, so much, and thank you, everyone, for, for having me. And Your Royal Highness, it's wonderful to see you. Your Excellencies, Tim, thank you for taking the time. Um, I think that the question of how do you get that relationship back on track is one that's probably above my pay grade, but I can only speak as a journalist and someone who cares very deeply about um, the Middle East and the Gulf Arab states in particular because I found a home there. And I would say that the most important thing going forward in any dysfunctional relationship is to solve your failure to communicate, and I think that there is a serious failure to communicate at this point. Um, and I understand, frankly, both sides of this question, I hope, um, quite deeply in the sense that CNBC, we cover markets, we cover oil, we cover money. And when you think about energy, the big questions are who has it, who wants it, and how much are they willing to pay for it? And I think anyone who understands markets understands this question. However, energy, as we know, has the ability not only to move markets, but it has the ability to literally decide the fate of nations. And what's happened over the last decade, and particularly this is highlighted in the last six to nine months, given the situation with Russia and Ukraine, is you have really understood, I think, perhaps some in the United States for the very first time, that the center of gravity has perhaps shifted. And I'm talking about the fact that there is a great deal more importance, frankly, at this time, as to the relationship between the Gulf Arab countries and the West. Under the Obama administration, as many of you understand and know, there were a lot of shifts. And I was sitting in a room with you in Bahrain when President Obama um, announced the shift and pivot to Asia. And that, I remember, caused a great deal of discomfort in that room. I literally saw fear in the eyes of the Gulf Arab representatives there. What does this mean for us? You know, are they going to move the Fifth Fleet? What is this? And I think in that time, you have seen the Gulf Arab countries, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, um, 
you know, taking a much more firm direction as to their own foreign policy, their own economic policy. And that has caused a great deal of discomfort in the United States. And one of the things that I would say is that regardless of administration or energy policy, people are just gonna have to suck it up and understand that this is the reality going forward. You have China as the largest foreign direct investor in the UAE and Saudi Arabia at this point. They have close ties to the rest of the world. And I think that A, that's a fundamental piece of discomforting news, I think to many in, in various administrations, um, that's something they're gonna have to get past. But also when you think about it with regards to the energy situation, today, the OPEC plus decision on cuts, if you look at this from a market perspective, None of us were surprised this is something that they were ready to do and willing to do. Because at the end of the day, this is about supporting your people. It's supporting your own economy. And who can argue with that? Who can say that is a bad thing? However, let us just say that for us in the media, particularly someone like me who looks at these issues fundamentally through the prism of US foreign policy and frankly, how does this impact the people at home? Tone deaf was the phrase that came to mind. And I would say that in terms of the timing. Now, when we think about the timing, obviously what's happening with the war in Ukraine, it's just unfortunate, unfortunate mm -hmm. timing because you can't argue with the pictures of dead bodies. You can't argue with the idea that, especially right now with President Putin in the last 10 days launching over 300 airstrikes on electricity infrastructure, that over this winter, in a country that when it's between the months of November and February, the average like price, or not price, but temperature is 30 degrees, as in freezing, it'll be a choice between whether people freeze to death or they're killed by bombs or Russian soldiers. So my point is, the optics of this were very, very poor. And so when I come to the United States, beyond looking at my own channel, looking at other channels, for example, the outrage here is deafening. And unlike anything that I've seen, frankly, since the Khashoggi, instant. And so for me, looking at this, I think that getting this relationship back on track as quickly as possible is paramount. You mentioned Russia, you mentioned energy. You were the last Western journalist to interview President Putin before the invasion of Ukraine. You were just in Warsaw. Uh, it's going to be a tough winter yeah. in Europe. How do you see the war evolving, the attitudes that you pick up off the record toward the war in Europe, and uh, how do you see it evolving? Can there be a diplomatic off-ramp with Vladimir Putin in power? There's going to have to be, because he isn't going anywhere. Um, and I think that that's been the background that I've gotten from folks in Russia whom I still communicate with regularly. Um, and that has also been the background, frankly, that we hear elsewhere. Um, at the end of the day, when we talk about a price cap on Russian oil, or that suggestion, or the idea that the G7 are going to ram that down the throats of people in India, people in China and elsewhere, and expect them to go along with it. But that is not, they have a moral responsibility to their own people, and that is not good for business. So that's not going to happen. And I think that the more that we push on those narratives, the more we alienate the rest of the world. And when it comes to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, I speak to the Ukrainians regularly. I talk to the foreign minister of Ukraine on an almost daily basis. Um, and I get a sense from him about how tough things really are. Um, you know, targeting civilian infrastructure, Ursula von der Leyen said it today, is frankly a, a war crime. They've defined it as such. And yet at the same time, the off-record conversations that I have with the Germans, that I have with the French, that I have with the Austrians and others, suggest to me that they understand with the energy prices going where they're going in terms of the gas price, they're gonna have a difficult time continuing to sell democracy versus people's pocketbooks. And I think that that's going to be reflected in the midterms as well. Emily, are we on or off the record here in your remarks, I should have asked? Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm speaking for me. Okay, you're speaking for Speaking you. for me. Okay, I'd like to open the floor up uh, for questions from, from the audience or comments. Oda Aberdeen. Regarding energy, Henry Kissinger, Microphone. Said power also comes from a barrel of oil, and it seems we have forgotten about that. The other thing that I have discovered is that we lack good imagination. I mean, who ever thought that a war in Ukraine would disrupt oil supplies? So there's some shortcoming on our side for doing the right clinical rationale. 
my mic holder, thank you, Your Excellency. <laughs> um, I think you're absolutely right, and the man who could probably answer a little bit more about the 1973 oil embargo is probably sitting right in front of me, Your Royal Highness, um, who had a front row seat for this. Um, but I would say that that's the only time, technically, that OPEC has ever used energy as a weapon. When I spoke with Vladimir Putin, I asked him directly, are you using energy as a weapon? He, of course, denied that. But what we've seen is um, his 20-year plan, frankly, to hold energy markets hostage. And what I mean by that is his first job in the Kremlin um, in his early days there was to understand where all of the energy was in post-Soviet Russia. Who owns it? How can we control it? Where can we you know, navigate you know, a way forward here? And I think that, frankly, policymakers in Europe and in the United States should be held accountable for the fact that either they, A, don't understand how the energy markets actually work, how industry, heavy industry, needs oil, coal, gas to function, and that the idea of renewables, while wonderful, and something that is certainly coming and should be invested in heavily because we have to throw everything at the wall in order to figure out how to solve the problem, is today not going to get us where we need to get. And I think that the more that policymakers um, speak to the public um, about something perhaps of which they know very little, the more trouble that we are in. Because you're misinforming the public, and I'm talking about whether it be in the United States or in Europe, because I think certainly that the Germans and the French and the rest of the Europeans had a major role to play in the situation in which they now find themselves. And what is shocking to me, frankly, on a very personal note, is how there has been um, no move at this point to hold those people accountable. The German government, for example, for selling their national security down the river. That just blows my mind. Speaking for me. <laughs> just me, not CNBC. Other questions for Hadley? Comments? Yes, Elab. In light of all the challenges in the energy market, how do you think the maritime uh, border agreement between Israel and Lebanon can affect the energy market in the short term and in the long term? And just uh, Elad is the spokesperson for the ambassador of Israel, the embassy of Israel here in Washington. Um, it's an excellent question. And having no crystal ball, I can't tell you a, a very accurate answer. I think for Lebanon, which as you know, perhaps is very close to my heart, all good news is good news for that country. So the, that should not be an achievement that anyone can take away from Office Hochstein or from the administration. It was a wonderful thing that they managed to do in terms of that agreement. And congratulations um, uh, in that solving that minor issue, which is actually a very big issue. But how quickly that you can get exploration going, how quickly for, for a country that is literally broke and that fights you know, each other seven ways from Sunday can move on that, I think, is anybody's guess, because what international oil or gas company wants to get involved with a government that they can't trust? So. Other questions? In this room, there's got to be another question on uh, oil energy in the Middle East. <coughs> Your Royal Highness. Please, of course. Thank you, Ms. Gamble. I don't know everything about the 73 war. <laughs> But uh, one thing, um, <laughs> President Biden's statement yesterday, I think it was, on the energy issues here, I very much reflected what the kingdom has been saying for some time, which is that the America should produce more oil, they should invest in the fossil fuels and expand uh, that, not give up the renewables, as you said, but put in place a program that will make the transition easy rather than difficult. Do you see that reflected as a way of Saudi Arabia and America getting over the brouhaha that resulted from the, from the actions taken by open process? I think that any conversation is a good conversation. I don't necessarily know that that is the going to be the impetus to fixing this issue. I think what's really interesting is that when you think about the energy markets as a whole and what drives um, investment, um, we know all of the facts. We understand you know, the era of cheap money is over. We understand there is recession, there is inflation. Um, and China, in President Xi's address to the party Congress, essentially said that he's doubling down on his um, COVID strategy, zero COVID, which basically should, should be a very big warning signal to folks that, that the market is going to see increased volatility. You've got to remember that the United States is the swing producer. As much as we talk about a shift to green energy and to clean technology, America still has a role to play 
So I think it's great that the president has acknowledged this, but one wonders if that's going to translate into action because I have to tell you that the CEOs of major energy companies that I speak to on a very regular basis still tell me they have no relationship with the White House. Despite the meetings that they had with the oil companies? They don't seem to see that they are making a way forward, but I've got them at a conference in just a few days, so I'll, <laughs> I'll be asking those questions, no doubt, you know, but still. Question here. Thank you. Hadley, great to see you. Uh, Tom Sanderson, formerly CSI, and so now running my own consultancy. Um, over the last few weeks, the majority of the calls that my team and I have been getting <clears throat> are concerning scenarios for China and Taiwan that can impact the supply chain. And in the conduct of a few of the studies we've been doing for uh, clients, uh, one of the primary responses has been to suggest a U.S. blockade of oil coming to China as a means to exert leverage on China should they uh, take Taiwan. Are you hearing that at all in your discussions, concern about that? I think the concern about that is less real um, in, in just in the conversations that I'm having. But what's interesting to me and something that I've spoken to various US officials about is when you think about the energy dynamics and what flows through the Strait of Hormuz, half of the oil that goes to China to feed the engine of global growth comes from the Gulf Arab countries. So wouldn't it behove any administration to have a working dialogue with them to talk about how do we use those relationships for us, for them, at a time when the president's talking about containing China? So if you want to contain China, wouldn't it make a little bit more sense in terms of the energy dynamic to, to be speaking to people who actually control that flow of energy? Just a thought. First, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Ambassador Montez Zahran of Egypt. Thank you for joining us. Welcome. Other questions for Hadley? I saw a hand for a minute. Any thoughts? Oda, you had a question. <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay, please. <clears throat> Joe Alfred, Ally Power. Uh, what are you looking to uh, most uh, about the upcoming COP27 in Egypt as yeah. I'm sitting right, standing right in front of? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, we'll be there because we're CNBC. We're first in business worldwide, so we will be there, um, and which I'm very much looking forward to. Um, I think that a, a realistic discussion, maybe unlike what we saw in Glasgow, at this point about what's really happening in the energy markets is, is key and essential. Um, you know, at that time we heard uh, from the CEO of Aramco, from various oil ministers, talking about the fact that we have uh, an energy crisis that's evolving and coming. No one was listening. Everyone was talking about, you know, the science of, of climate change and, and things that are very, very important. But at the same point, clearly people were talking across each other. So I think from policymakers, um, as well as, you know, from just from a purely journalistic point of view, we're deeply hoping that we get, you know, a realistic assessment of the way forward at this point, um, because we need to be investing in capacity building um, on an enormous scale, and it's not happening. So I think that for journalists who understand the market, that's like the message that we would like to hear beyond this wonderful idea of going to clean energy, to net zero, all these things. Let's talk about the things that are achievable in the short term. I saw a hand in the back. Yes, please, uh, Karen. I don't think I need a mic, do I? Hadley, my question is, is something that's been sort of puzzle, a puzzle to me. You mentioned the lack of communication, which is certainly a problem, but there's also this real misunderstanding. I heard a webinar this morning where Senator Murphy was saying that Saudi Arabia was, could single-handedly set the price of, uh, of oil in global markets. and. And so this misunderstanding in the highest levels of U.S. government and the animosity directed towards Saudi Arabia and not other members of OPEC Plus in their relations with Russia or in their um, decisions to cut production is really a puzzle to me. And, and I wonder how you see that sitting in Abu Dhabi, but also now here in Washington. You know, what would make a difference to explain and can you explain? Is it are people even interested in hearing? Education? Yeah, but maybe they don't want to understand it, right? That's sort of what I'm thinking. I think it's, it, it, you're right in the sense that I think that just as journalists, we've seen um, public opinion post um, the murder of Jamal Khashoggi very much shift 
I think that there is a, is a narrative that had Saudi Arabia during the Trump years extended more of a hand to the Democratic Party, we wouldn't be in this situation today, i.e. there would be more of a conversation happening between the Democratic leadership and the Saudi Arabia and, 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 and. But I think there is a fundamental issue of understanding the market, understanding market dynamics, I mean the so-called cartel, um, and, and not looking back at themselves and understanding that America is the swing producer. So if you really want to influence policy, you've got to play the game with everybody else, in my mind. Question here. So I mean, like, kind of a basic question, but we have a world market for oil. Can't hear you, please. <coughs> Sorry. Turn it up. <laughs> I made that mistake too. Sorry, I'm not used to this. If we have a world market for oil, where is the benchmark set? How does that happen? I mean, do people really understand the mechanics of pricing? Yeah. Because I mean, that is a fundamental, right? Right. Well, that's being supposedly based on the idea of supply and demand, which, if you look at it on the face of it, these cuts were expected. I mean, when you look at the in environment in which we're living right now, just the, uh, the known unknowns, like the Russia price cap, um, the idea that the sanctions are coming in early December, that's going to create market volatility. You look at the fact that they are deeply underinvested for years. You don't have the oil that you need on the table. And then the cuts actually reflect, frankly, everything that's happening more globally in the economy. You know, the era of cheap money, as I said, is over. What's happening with central banks, the power of the dollar. I think the more interesting things going forward are at what point, and I've asked this question before, does Saudi Arabia decide to accept, you know, China's currency for oil? You know, when do we go off the US dollar for that? These are the questions that I tend to ask, and I think that they are very much tied to central bank policy, um, and frankly, uh, just the sort of geopolitical shift that we're seeing. Um, but when you think about market dynamics, there are, there are different benchmarks now. Obviously, the Merbon futures, like there are different benchmarks for setting prices. And I think that what's going to be interesting going forward is um, given the blowback on OPEC as the so-called cartel, if OPEC members continue to want to be a part of that organization simply because of the bad rap that they've gotten as a result and how that will impact prices. But I think the volatility, unfortunately, is here to stay. Yeah, one more question. I think mean, there's a few more out there in the back. Yeah. Thank you, Hadley. Gabriel Christensen, partner at KL Gates. In your discussions with Putin, Could you use the microphone, please? please? Oh, okay, we got it there. <laughs> yeah. Guillermo Christensen, a partner at KL Gates. In your discussions with Putin, do you have a sense for what an off ramp and exit strategy looks like for him if he has something in mind now that he's realizing that um, the world is not going to bend to him the same way that it has before. Is there some sense of what one could work with in that area? To be clear, I haven't spoken with Mr. Putin since in a year, just so you're aware. Um, I sadly do not get a call from the Kremlin to get the in internal workings of his mind. Um, just just FYI. Um, but uh, it's interesting because the, the conversations that I've been having um, with Russians and there are a lot of Russians in the UAE today, but the conversations that I've been having Russian, with Russians in Russia um, have essentially revolved around the idea that it is not a question of if he plans to use tactical nuclear weapons, it's how. And that it, you've seen this great migration of men out of the country in recent weeks, not just because of conscription, but because if you have money, you're getting out of Russia. You're going anywhere else you can possibly get, and you're putting your money elsewhere, and you're being very careful because you have no doubt that this is a man who does what he says he's going to do at whatever cost. And my sense of it, having spent several hours with him, one-on-one, um, -on -one, not just on a stage in front of a million people, but also privately, is that he has no doubts about what he believes and the way forward in his mind. And remember, there is no exit strategy for him. There is no after Putin. And this coup that everyone, you know, I think in the government was praying would actually happen if we just put a little bit more pressure on all his oligarchs has clearly not occurred. I mean, I see them and, and they're whining about they can't, you know, afford to take an Uber. They're not planning a coup. So, so I think if you take a step back and think about it, I mean, this is a man who took 20 years of watching the West 
and understanding how we think and understanding what democracy really looks like and the pain you know of the pocketbook versus the idea of influ influencing democratic values and, and, and et cetera, nation building if you will um, and he he saw us and he watched and he waited and he you know he I think in my mind in the conversations that I was having with him privately really took away this idea of what the weaknesses of democracy you know we are caring we do you know we do you know fly by the seat of our pants in a sense and you've seen that over the last six or seven months right with the you know, opportunities we've been given um, to have a reaction to President Putin, what we've done, and has been very emotive. We live in an age of emotion, and I think that, by the way, that's something that the, uh, the Gulf Arab countries need to get to get with very quickly, um, to understanding that. But I would say with Putin, the CEO of a major European energy company told me, um, following my panel with Putin, he was like, I was so mad at you, all you did was go geopolitics, geopolitics, and I said to him, to me, energy and politics and security is the same, and he said, well, I have to tell you, in my meeting with Putin, who he met two hours after I did in Russia that day a year ago, he said, we spent a couple hours together, and he, I went home to my people in Paris, you can imagine who this person is, and he said, this man understood the European gas market down to the last molecule, he understood it better than all of my best guys, so he knew what he was doing, 